Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of your word that is inspired of your spirit and helpful in every generation. And though we do not live in ancient Ephesus and surrounding communities, and although our social systems are not identical, we know that the principles of Scripture apply, and we need your help. So Holy Spirit, illumine truth for us, that we may apply it in a way that honors you and lifts up the name of Jesus above all other names. It is in his name we pray and ask for your help. Amen. So let's step back in time. 2,000 years, roughly. Women, you are property. Children, also property. Slaves, also property. I know you're human beings, but 2,000 years ago, you were much less than you are now, at least by society standards. You had almost no rights, hardly any privileges. And it is in that context that Paul writes the words we're about to read. It is not a letter to modern Americans, and you can't read it that way. And so let's use good hermeneutics, good exegesis, which is fancy ways of saying, let's read the Bible as it was intended for the people it was written to and draw forth the principles we can really use. With that in mind, I want to look at the text, Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 22. This is a text that has been abused and misused for centuries. And today I hope to clear the air and help us to use it well. God help us to do that. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives... Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, quote, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land, end quote. So fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Someone provoked this child, obviously. (laughs) Just kidding. I think it's great. I think it's great. Just to be clear, we love children in this church. Just keep them quiet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if, you, if you learn the secret to that, please tell me, because I have three of my own. Fathers, therefore, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then this word bond servants is doulos. It's really the word slave. It sounds a little nicer when you call them bond servants. But keep in mind, by slave, we don't mean transatlantic African slaves or skin color slaves. We're talking about indentured servants. So either they or their parents had outstanding debts that couldn't be paid. So these kind of slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or is free. Masters, do the same to them. Stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there's no partiality with him. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. That's a heavy word. It's full of conviction and challenge. And as I've said, it's one that has been twisted and abused for far too long. So what is Paul really saying? 
Well, I will tell you the first half of our scripture, the end of chapter 5, was read at my wedding. I had two requests, that we read Ephesians 5 and that we take communion as our first act as a couple. Those are my only two requests, and both of them were carried out at our wedding. And I'm thankful for that. But now I'm looking back thinking, I wonder how many people understood why I wanted to have that read. Because if you just go to a wedding and you hear Ephesians 5, wives submit to your husbands, you probably start to think, wow, this is an awfully traditional wedding. But that's not what I intended. Rather, the good part for me, I don't mind that part. That sounds nice, wives submit to your husbands. But the good part comes later. Husbands, lay down your lives for your wife just like Christ laid down his life for the church to sanctify her, to keep her pure, without blemish, without spot or wrinkle, to sanctify her. That's what you're supposed to do for your wife. Give away yourself for her. And wives, if you have a husband like that, how could you not respect that man and lift him up? And so there's this beautiful picture of symbiotic marriage, mutually beneficial marriage, mutually submissive marriage. But that's not realistic. That's wishful thinking. I've been married for almost 10 years now, and I'm telling you, it's wishful thinking. And so Paul says, I know. I know it doesn't really work. But it's a mystery, a profound mystery, and it's supposed to be a picture of Christ and the church. But Paul, it doesn't work. I've counseled all kinds of couples over the last decade in ministry, and some were premarital counseling, some were in the middle of pains of marriage. Some were after divorces or disillusionments, and people needed counsel during that process. I'm grateful to have ministered to a lot of people in their marriages, but there are some common themes, and I would argue that these two things transcend marriage. There are common issues in family counseling and mediation between friends. Really, any counseling I've ever been a part of, these two things stand out to me, and they are two errors in human relationship. The first is the error of the goodness of power, People think power is inherently good. And you're as guilty as anybody else, and so am I. We think power is good. We want power. We try to have power. We lust for power. Even though we know most atrocities and evils in the world are rooted in the human thirst for power. But we still, for some reason, we think it's a good thing to have power. And then the second is like unto the first, as Jesus would say. And it is this, the way things were is the way they ought to always be kind of thinking. Uh, golden ageism. I often joke with older friends who say, man, when I was a kid, it was a lot better. And I say, yeah, unless you were black, uh, right? I mean, this, it's perspective, isn't it? We can't pretend everything was better in the past. Or if you like hot showers and, and medicines over the counter like I do, it wasn't better 100 years ago. Some things may have been and other things weren't. But that's this strange thing that people have stuck in their minds, that God's intention is to restore the way things were. That is only true if you're talking about Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, when man and woman, both carrying the beautiful image of God in harmony in the garden, were naked without shame, when all things were perfect. If that's what you're talking about, yes, that's what we're trying to get back to. But if you're talking about anything after Genesis 3, any point in human history from that point on, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's not the goal. Because no moment in human history other than the very beginning is representative of God's intention or his good plan. We look forward to a new heavens and a new earth. And so there, there are these two big flaws in our thinking. One, that power is good, and the other, that the way things were is the way they ought to be. And a mixture of these results in misogyny and bigotry and the abuse of power and slave trade and all kinds of other evils that still exist today. We don't have time to get into some of these actual issues. So instead, I want to talk about the biblical principles here in this text and all over the Bible that address these issues so that you as individuals can go out in the world as Christian people and do something different. Because that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, hey, I know you can't change the society of ancient Rome. You're just some Christians in a church in modern-day Turkey. But back then, it would have been Ephesus and surrounding communities. You're, you're just some everyday people attending a church service. I get it. And you're, read, you're reading a letter from an apostle of Jesus. I get it. You can't change your circumstance, but you can do something different with it, even if that's just changing your perspective of it, to understand that what you do is for God. And it changes everything. So that those with power are encouraged with the responsibility to use their power as God did. 
sacrificially. And those without power are encouraged that their sacrifices, their humbling experience is just like that of Jesus when he walked the earth and that they understand Jesus better than most people ever will. And what they do is not wasted. God will reward them and God will vindicate them. And so both parties, those with power, those without power are addressed, but they're not addressed the way we think they are. And they're certainly not addressed the way that we probably want them to be. And so when I counsel these couples and I see these problems, one of the answers I give is is something easy to remember, and that is marriage is not 50-50, it's 100-100. Some of you will probably raise your hand and say, I told you that at some point, because I use it a lot. Marriage isn't 50-50. You can't each give half and expect a marriage to work. Both parties have to give full effort. The problem is no marriage ever looks like that. No one ever is partnered with someone who, at, at one given time, both parties are giving full effort to that relationship. But that's true in every relationship. That principle, that both parties or all parties have to give full effort to the relationship. And so I give that advice to anyone, friends, married couples, parents and children, employee, employer relations, whatever. Give all of your effort to a good relationship to make it good. None of this 50-50 stuff. So what what does Jesus say about this before we get back to Paul? Because I don't want you to think Paul is an anomaly in the New Testament, that he suddenly came up with this idea he clearly borrowed it from Christ. Jesus not only taught it, but he showed it, but he did teach it. Luke 14, 11, my favorite verse in the whole Bible. The one who exalts himself or herself will be humbled, yet the one who humbles himself or herself will be exalted or lifted up. It's so simple. God blesses humility, and he judges pride. And there are fancy Greek words for that, some that I want to look at, in fact. Words like hypoteso, antiteso, uh, ale, uh, ale lois, these Greek words that you don't care about. But, but they're important in the text because they're used elsewhere and they're translated differently at times. And they don't need to be because they carry the same meaning, the same weight of purpose. And they all have to do with subjecting oneself of showing loyalty to another, even in a difficult circumstance. And Paul isn't the only one who used these words. The early church, who still spoke and wrote in Greek in the Hellenized world, the first couple of centuries of church history, they still used these words, and they still gave this kind of instruction to believers. Here are a few examples. Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, less than 100 years after Paul, encouraged the church at Magnesia. He said, submit to the bishop and to one another. So not just the elders or pastors of a church, but to one another. Submit. Submit. Alleluia. It's identical to Ephesians 5.21 and 1 Peter 5.5. Peter talks about the same thing. Submit yourselves one to another. That's an act of Christian love, mutual submission. I'm telling you this because I think there are preachers today who are going around. I know there are. I've read blogs even this week about it, and I'm not going to quote names but you could Google it. There are preachers who will tell you this is all a myth, that because it seems unrealistic, it's, it's wishful thinking, that it must not be true. The same people who tell you resurrection is true and that eternal life in paradise is real and that God created all things in the beginning tell you that this, this idea of people being able to submit one to another, that, that could not be true. That's a myth. If you can believe God created all things with purpose, that he can raise the dead to life, that he has plans for your eternal future. How can you not also believe that part of that plan is for you to learn how to submit power one to another? We must believe it's true. It's not a myth. And the early church didn't believe it's a myth, just like St. Paul or St. Peter or Jesus Christ himself. It's not a myth. It's not wishful thinking. It's, it's God's command. It is a promise of God. It is God on display on the cross. And so Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, also writing in the early second century, told the Philippians, all of you be subject one to another. Again, an almost identical phrase from the New Testament. Polycarp's instructions sound just like 1 Peter 5, verse 5. And I think when Peter wrote his verse, chapter 5, verse 5 in our Bible, he was telling the recipients of his letter, all of you be submissive to each other. That's how I would translate the Greek. Now, there's some grammar issues that some people could argue it was referring to the next verse. So let's put that aside. How about our text, Ephesians 5 and 6? There is no doubt 
grammatically speaking, in Ephesians, he is saying you must be subject to one another. This is mutual submission. Mutual submission. Everybody has to be ready to give up power for the good of another. That is part and parcel of the good news of Jesus, that you must be willing to give up power and privilege for the sake of another's good. Hippoteso. It's associated with humility. And it is the opposite of antiteso, which is what is used when uh, in the New Testament you read, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's the word for proud, antiteso. But Jesus commands hippoteso, this humility of spirit that you are willing to submit to others. So how we practice this humility, this submission or deference, cooperation, loyalty, those are some of the other translations. How you use those things in your life matters as Christians. It matters in your marriages. It matters in your parenting. It matters with your parents or grandparents. It matters in the workplace. It it truly matters in every relationship in which you find yourself today. This principle matters. What will you give away in order to be more like Jesus? I often ask myself, what can I do to be more like Jesus? But I rarely ask, what can I do less or what can I give up to be more like Jesus? And yet that is what I see from Jesus, is all the ways he gives things up, gives himself away. But that's not what I'm after. I want Jesus because he gives me things, not because he makes me give things away. And I think that's just a human problem. All of us are called to be mutually submissive one to another. And again, it's not just the early church, it's not just Paul, it's not just Peter, it is Jesus himself. And Paul talks about how this applies in other letters. In 1 Corinthians, he applies it in chapter 8 with the weaker Christian. If you have a brother or sister in the faith whose conscience is pricked by the eating of food offered to idols, you may remember this passage. There are people going to temples, to pagan deities, false Roman gods, and they're eating meat at these temples after sacrifices are made. So there's no question you don't attend the religious ceremony. You don't worship false gods. But what about afterwards when they eat the leftover meat? They have lunch at the temple. And a lot of people eat that meat and they think they get special blessings from it. It's part of the ancient custom. And Paul says, some of you are going there and having lunch. And then he doesn't say, you can't do that anymore. He says, that's fine. You know it doesn't mean anything. These gods are no gods. They're make-believe. It's fine. Here's the problem. You have friends in the church, and those people still kind of believe in these other gods. They're they're wrestling. They have a weaker conscience. When they see you eat that meat, they think maybe there are blessings from other gods. Maybe there's something to this. Maybe we are allowed to do this after all. And you cause them to, it literally says, to make them to fall or to stumble or trip them. And he says, if that's you, quit. Yeah, I know you can, but it doesn't mean you should. Where did he learn that principle? That just because you can doesn't mean you should. I wonder if maybe he learned it from Jesus. Jesus was being arrested outside the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, Peter, put your sword away. Don't you know I have legions of angel armies with much more powerful swords than you? They could rescue me right now. I could do that, but I'm not, and I won't. It is this restraint of power that is the example of Christ. But it is so rarely the example of Christ's followers because we love power. And I know because I have a lot of it. I'm a white, straight man in America who's a pastor of a church. I've got quite a bit of clout, especially for a young person. I don't want to give that up. Many of you look up to me in this room. That's cool. I mean, it feels good to be respected, to have some sort of privilege over people. But that's not Christ. That's not the way he lived. It's not what he did. It's not what he commanded. But it is very human. In Galatians 3.28, Paul wrote a famous verse. He's talking about even the nature of salvation. He says, there is now no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You are all one. In Christ. It's not only a teaching about unity, but about equality. That is, preachers are fond of saying, at the cross, it's level ground, right? There is no favoritism. And that's how this passage ended in Ephesians. There is no partiality with God. 
There is no partiality with God. James goes on and on about it. If you're partial, it's as if you don't even know God. How can you say you know God if you're playing favorites? Because that is the opposite of God's character. God doesn't have favorites. You have favorites, but God doesn't. And part of following Jesus is learning that there aren't any favorites, that there aren't good guys and bad guys. That's a myth that the world is trying to sell you. This is difficult stuff. So Paul, in this one passage, has encouraged those without power that God is blessing them in their current status, even the slaves, even the women who are merely property of their husbands, even the children. By the way, in Roman society, I'm not talking about in the church, but in ancient Rome in general, if a young man became a magistrate, like a senator of Rome, his father still had license to have him executed for dishonoring him. So it didn't matter if you, if you really rose on the ladder of society, your dad was still able to have you killed. That's how they view children. Adopted children had more rights than biological children in ancient Rome. And most children who were adopted were adopted as adults for inheritance purposes, not like we adopt little children to give them a home. Children were property. They were legacy. They were inheritance. They were not viewed the way we view them. You have to know this context of 2,000 years ago in Ephesus in order to appreciate what Paul is writing. He's saying in that society, you're not going to change all of that, but you can view it differently. You can live differently. You who are merely property of another, don't forget you're not property. You are God's children. You are co-heirs with Christ. You are his body. You are his bride. You are his beloved. And he has good plans for you. And if you are treated unjustly, he will vindicate you. And whatever work you do in that position, it is honoring God. And he will bless you for it. Don't give up hope. But then he turns every time to those with power, who are the people probably reading the letter most of the time. And he says, and you, don't abuse your wives. She better not have a spot, wrinkle, or blemish when you're through with her. And fathers, do not provoke your children. And slave drivers, do not threaten your slaves because you have a slave driver in heaven and you belong to him and he doesn't play favorites. So there is responsibility for those with power and there is encouragement for those who are powerless all in one breath. And Paul says, this is the way the kingdom works. This is God's economy. Power shifts. Power is shared. He even proved this in his own life. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I don't think we'll have time for this passage, but he talks about the foolishness of the cross. Why is it foolish? It's folly to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to the Jews. Why? Because, Because it empties people of power and gives all the power back to God. The cross is a way of saying, you are not in control. The sooner you figure it out, the better. And Jesus shows us that. But that's hard. He says, take up your cross. Go the thorny way. And if there be a sponge of vinegar offered to you, take it. Life is made of this difficult journey. That's an old poem. It's profound. We we don't understand. We don't appreciate the gravity of carrying a cross. It was not just a sign of torture and death. It was a picture of shame and humility. That the God of the universe would carry a torture device and be mocked and flogged and beaten and bloodied. It's not just a story of God's wrath for sin. It's a story of the powers of the world and how broken they are. That God would be murdered by his own created children. But of course, he couldn't stay dead because he's God. And so the resurrection is a sign that the power was never theirs to begin with, that the very sources that claim to have power have none. And right now, many of us are still part of that. And Jesus says, get over here. Why are you still living in that realm where you think there's power and there is none? The power is with me and it is self-giving and sacrificial and it breeds peace and unity, not dissension and war and violence but you have to give up your power. You have to mutually submit one to another. And so Jesus tells us and shows us and Paul tells us and Paul shows us in Romans 16. He talks about Phoebe, a diaconess of the church at Sincre, which means a deacon, boo hiss of a female deacon in the Bible. Some of you were taught that can't even exist, but Phoebe is called a deacon of the church at Sincre. It's right there in your Bible. In Romans 16, And she is delivering the letter from Paul to the church in Rome. 
And Paul isn't concerned about anything about her gender or her status. Rather, he says, she is a deacon of the church. You can trust her. She works for me. I'm an apostle. She's a deacon. I have authority over her. But then he says right after that, and she has been my benefactor or my patron throughout my ministry, meaning I live off of her money, but she submits to me as an apostle. Mutual submission. Paul understood. I can be in charge of someone in the church as an apostle over a deacon, a servant. That's what deacon means. But then I can also serve under her as a patron, that she can pay my way. She has a gift of income that I don't have, and I have a gift of authority from Jesus that she doesn't have, and we can help each other. That's a good system. Both parties benefit. Both parties share and submit their power one to another in different ways. That's mutual submission in practice. It works. We just don't do it. Jeffrey Miller, a modern pastor, he writes, mutual submission happens from above, from below, and beside, meaning in every relationship, in every capacity possible. It means that authority between believers is temporary and situational. I'll say that again. It means, because I think this is good, authority for believers is temporary and situational. So you only have authority for a moment in time, for a purpose in time. You are not the authority. No human being is the authority, but God gives some people authority in some areas at certain times for certain purposes, and it changes hands. This is now Miller's words. It changes hands depending on context, giftedness, and need. In marriage, this means that leadership is shared and exchanged based on each spouse's expertise and need. So this is why in some households, the woman manages the finances, but in other households, it's the man. Well, who's in charge? They both are. It's their household together, but one may have more giftedness in finance or mathematics, and the other one may not. Is that making sense? This is real-life teaching, okay? Authority is not something to be grasped. It is for the benefit of those over whom the authority is exercised. Authority is only helpful when it benefits those the authority is over. If authority is abused, then it's not leadership at all. It's, it's abuse, And it doesn't help any relationship grow or be healthy. In the church, it's not just marriage, in the church, in the the greater world, it means that sometimes men will need to submit to women, sometimes women will need to submit to men, not because of simply gender, but giftedness or calling. In the same way, older believers may have to submit to younger believers, and younger believers may have to submit to older believers. Leaders, even pastors, have to submit to their congregations or communities, and vice versa. That is what mutual submission would look like in practice. All parties willing to give up their privilege, their status, their power, whatever they have, willing to give it away, even if it's temporary, for the good of the other. And if you don't see that that is exactly what Jesus did for you, then you're not paying attention. That is the good news, that God gave up his privilege and his power so that he could share it with you, to, to call you fellow heirs, co-heirs of the kingdom of God, to call you children, siblings in Christ, children of God. There is a place made for you, set apart in my father's house, many rooms prepared, so I can take you to be with myself. Jesus was already there. He had his own room, but he gave it up, even temporarily, so that he could make a space for you. That is the good news that God gives away his power and privilege so that you can be welcomed in. And there's no other way for you to be welcomed in apart from Christ Jesus who gave what he had to welcome you in. He's the only one who had that power to be able to give it up. So what do you have in your position, in your life? What power, what privilege, what positionality do you have in this world in relationships to affect good change for another? What could you give up to be more like Jesus or to honor him? We would call that cruciform living, life shaped by the cross. And it is what Jesus labeled abundant life. Because I promise you, power is not the path to health or wholeness, but loving humility. It was the path that led Jesus to the throne above all thrones, to the kingdom that will last forever. And it is that love and humility that will lead you to be co-heirs with Christ in that kingdom. But it is only the love of God. Just read the Gospels. You'll see it for yourself. We talk a lot about what we're saved from. 
but we don't talk enough about what we're saved for. We know what we're saved from, from human power, lust, and evil, death, murder, war, famine, disease, simply sin that breaks us down and leads to depression and guilt and anxiety and pain of different kinds, systemic sin that's beyond us, suffering and injustice all over the world. God saves us from that whole mess of stuff in here and out there. We get that, and that is so important. But what are you saved for? What's going to replace that world and that broken system, if not a better one, a new world, a new heavens and new earth in which people live differently than they do here? And then God says, my church is heaven on earth. It's that picture. And so Jesus taught you to pray. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to exemplify now for the watching world what the coming kingdom can be like. But that means we have to exemplify it. We have to do it. Unity, peace, justice, love. The only way we will see these things come to pass is if we are willing to give up our power and submit ourselves one to another. Would you stand with me as we close? I'd like to use a liturgy written by St. Paul. This is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. He describes the path of Jesus, the cruciform path, the cross-shaped, self-giving love of Jesus. And then he has this liturgical worship moment where we praise God together because he is shaping us by the same cross with which he shaped Jesus' journey. And we will become like him if we follow faithfully. And so this will be our word of worship here at the end that will lead us to the Lord's table. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form, and this is unfair, it's not just servant, it's doulos, it means slave. Same word from Ephesians 5. By taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. That's the great irony. Because he died, because he emptied himself, he was exalted. The only exaltation will come after emptying. But if you are not emptied, then all that's left for you to, to do is to be humbled. But if you humble yourself, Luke 14, 11, Jesus says, then I can exalt you. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus knew that it is better to become the king that people want to follow than to be the king who makes people follow. And the same is true for husbands and fathers, and employers, and friends. Be the person others would want to serve with by serving them. Be the greatest by becoming the servant of all. It's hard. It's wishful thinking, I know. But I'm starting to understand the 50-50 thing. Uh, maybe I was wrong. Maybe marriage is 50-50, at least when we're talking about power. Because only when we're willing to share power, to give our half up, to another. Maybe it's only then that trust can be formed, that love can really happen. And so it has in Christ for each of you, for us, that as God gave himself freely, he invited you in. And as he gave up his power and took the form of a slave, of a human, crucified, he was explaining to you just how much he loves you and just how much he wants to be with you forever. And that's why we come to the table. Because at this table, we are made equals, coming to receive the very same gift week after week. That is the body and blood of Jesus, represented in bread and juice, pictures of the self-giving love of God in Christ, and reminders of the mission that we are on as his people, to then go and give ourselves away for the good of others, so that we can be like him, so that we can honor him, so that we can understand his love. Would you pray with me? Father, we are thankful for this table and for this moment together in time. I'm thankful for these, my friends, who are gathered here today to worship you, 
to sing praises to you, to celebrate what you've done. And as we come to the Lord's table, as we honor the body and blood of your son, Jesus, we are filled with your spirit in unity of faith. And I pray that we would also be filled with unity in practice, that we would leave with the resolve to love well and to give ourselves away, even as we receive your gift right now. It is in Christ's name we ask it. And we give you all the praise and the glory. Amen.